much, Dr. Kamansky. Our next presentation is another one of our fellows, our glaucoma fellow, Arwa Alsamare, who's going to be talking about the triumphant trabeculectomy. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to be talking about uh, the triumph of trabeculectomy. Uh, no financial disclosures. Basically, this is a talk on why filtering bloods are here to stay. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of glaucoma and trabeculectomies. And then I'll talk a little bit about some issues that exist with trabeculectomies and some alternative options that we have for TRABs. And then I'll briefly talk and mention about the uh, TRAB versus tube study, which was uh, something that was recently published. And uh, I'll talk about a brief case presentation. So glaucoma is, uh, it represents the second leading cause of blindness worldwide, so there's a lot of morbidity associated with it globally. Um, it's defined as an optic neuropathy for which intraocular pressure is a modifiable risk factor. And so all of our, all of our treatment modalities uh, rely on getting that pressure lower, so that includes, that includes um, medications to lower the IOP, whether it's topical or oral medications laser procedures, and then minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries versus the traditional incisional surgical interventions, including the trabeculectomy and things like a tube shunt. In terms of the history of surgical management, I think uh, you mentioned William McKenzie as one of, the, uh, uh, one of the people that you mentioned. And so he published one of the first um, sort of uh, glaucoma interventions in 1830 by passing a narrow knife, one millimeter posterior to clear cornea and allowing fluid to drain that way. Um, in you know, 18, 1857, the first LPI, PI, not LPI, was uh, described. And then uh, sort of an old school TRAB was published in 1870s, but the mo more modern day TRAB that we're still doing today was published in 1968 in the American Journal of Ophthalmology uh, by Cairns there. And we're doing it somewhat similarly at this point. And so a trabeculectomy, for those who might not be familiar, it's essentially when you do a limited conjunctival pyridomy with a partial thickness scleral flap, you create an ostomy to allow fluid to drain from the anterior chamber subconjunctivally. And there's a lot of variation for how you do a TRAB in the sense that you, know, you can do it exactly the same way, but in terms of how you're closing the scleral flaps, you might need two uh, sutures, you might need three. Uh, Dr. Briskin and I had a patient where we did six or seven sutures, so it really depends on, on, uh, on the flow afterwards. So there's a little bit of sort of voodoo um, and surgical nuance associated with TRABs. And the other thing is that if you, if you think you're doing a TRAB exactly the same way in two different patients, they can respond very differently. So one TRAB can be perfectly you know, fine and have a beautiful filtering bleb and have very well controlled pressures and the other patient will scar down right away and have a, a you know, poor outcome. And so that's one of the reasons why people have started sort of straying away from TRABs is sort of the variability that exists with TRABs and the frustrating results that can come out of that. Um, there's a lot of meticulous post-operative management when it comes to TRABs as well. So, you know, you're seeing these patients one day after, three days after, twice the next week, twice the following week, weekly for a couple months. I mean, you're following them very, very closely and sort of raising that uh, TRAB and raising that blood almost like your own child. And so you're, uh, you know, there's a lot of close follow-up associated with that and there's a lot of variability as to when you're doing laser suture lysis, when you're injecting with mitomycin 5-FU, you know, um, needling, things like that. So there's a lot of close follow-up and that's another reason why people have sort of strayed away from them sometimes. The other thing to mention is that TRABs, although they can be extremely successful, can also have uh, very complicated outcomes. So, you know, you can have patients with hypotony maculopathy who do very poorly. You can have choroidal effusions and hemorrhages. You have a lifetime risk of blebitis and blood-related endophthalmitis. So, again, people have been sort of searching for a, a different version of a TRAB that would work without causing all of these um, side effects and, and complications. And so this is a little bit more for the residents here. So if, you have, if you're seeing um, a post-TRAB patient and you know, you're seeing them on call and the patient has a TRAB and a low IOP, you're gonna look at their bleb. So if their pressure is low and their bleb is high, then you say, well, that bleb is working too well, so you're over filtering. 
if the pressure is low and they have a low bleb, you want to you know, make sure it's side down negative and that you don't have a bleb leak. You want to look for choroidals and, and hypotony, which you can see in, in TRABs. If they come in and they have a high pressure with a TRAB and you see a high bleb with sort of a ring of steel phenomenon, you're worried that it's an encapsulated bleb and it's essentially not functioning. If you see a high, uh, a high bleb, I'm sorry, a low bleb with a high pressure, and they have a low anterior chamber depth, you're worried maybe this could be pupillary block versus something like a suprachoroidal hemorrhage or malignant glaucoma, so you want to take a look for that. Um, and then if you see that they have a low bleb and a high pressure, you can stick a gonio lens on there and look and see if the, if the ostium is blocked and if you need to laser that to allow for fluid to flow. So these are all you know, sort of part of the post-operative management of, of traps. And so, there's been a recent sort of glaucoma renaissance um, in, uh, in the glaucoma world where folks have been trying to develop alternative ways to get the pressure lower surgically without having to put patients through a trabeculectomy. And so this sort of started more recently with, with the eye stent and now the eye stent inject. And you know, we've got the hydrus now, which cannulates about three clock hours of Schlimm's canal. And you've got things like the Omni device, which will allow you to do either 180 degrees or 360 degrees of a visco canalostomy, sort of dilating uh, the channels distally <clears throat> alongside a trabeculotomy. We have things like the Cahook dual blade and ECP, which is endocyclophotocoagulation, where you're lasering the ciliary processes so that they decrease aqueous production. We have uh, the Zen, which is down in the left corner there, which Dr. Chaya calls a trab light, sort of a, a less um, efficient but um, somewhat functional trab. And then you have eye tract catheters to do, again, more uh, viscocanalostomy and things like that, tra trabeculotomy. So, <clears throat> you know, the, the thought was, okay, mix could be the end of trabeculectomies, and that's just not true. Um, so, as Brock mentioned a few weeks ago when he gave his mix talk, the question is, you know, <clears throat> are these minimally invasive procedures or are these really minimally effective procedures? MIGs are really at the mercy of episcleral venous pressure as well. So, you know, from the Goldman equation, pressure equals the rate of aqueous formation over the facility of outflow plus episcleral venous pressure. So even if we decrease the rate of aqueous formation to zero, which is not really possible, but even if we do that, and even if we eliminate, um, the, uh, if we maximize the facility of outflow, you still have to deal with episcleral venous pressure. And so for patients who have normal tension glaucoma who will progress at a pressure of nine or 10 and they need to be in the low single, you know, in the single digits, the, real, the only option you really have at this point for long-term consistent success is a trabeculectomy. So there's really always a place for a successful and effective trab, especially for these patients who are going to progress you know, at a pressure of 13 or something like that. There's not really a mix procedure that will consistently get you to low pressures. Um, you know, there's no, no real procedure that will do that long term other than a trabeculectomy at this point. So then the question comes about, so what about tubes? And so this was studied recently in the TRAB versus tube study, which was a multi-center randomized clinical trial across 17 institutions. Uh, the thing to note is that these patients, the majority of them were um, uh, enrolled after having already had a previous trabeculectomy and or a cataract or a cataract surgery in the past and they had had um, uh, poorly controlled glaucoma on max medical therapy. And so they looked at outcome measures in these patients putting either a second trab or a tube in these patients and they looked at uh, their, pre uh, their pressure, their vision, medication use, and then failure. And they defined failure as a pressure of more than 21 or a pressure that was not reduced by more than 20%. And they looked at hypotony as failure as well. And they looked at requiring re-op as failure and uh, an outcome of NLP as, as failure. And so when they looked at the five-year results of these patients, um, the IOP differences in the mean number of medications were better in the TRAB group. So the, overall, the pressure was lower in the trabeculectomy group, which we know trabeculectomies are going to get you the lowest pressure out of any um, glaucoma procedure when they're successful. So the mean IOP was lower in TRABs and the mean number of medications required was lower in TRABs. Um, and then the statistically significant results was failure probability and reoperation rate. And so the failure rate that they quoted, very, very high failure rate. So nearly 30% of tubes 
were considered as failing. And remember, we said that's pressure of higher than 21, or they didn't reduce by 20%, um, NLP, things like that. And so uh, two failures, about 30%, trap failures, almost 50% of traps failed in this study. It's a very high, uh, high failure rate. So in terms of consenting patients for a trap, if I were to say, yeah, you have a 50% of failing, that's a not very convincing um, evidence for a trap. Again, remember, these are second traps for the most part. So if they had already failed a previous trap or scarred it down, there's a good chance they're going to fail a second trap. And then in terms of reoperations, um, tubes needed, 9% of the tube patients needed a reoperation, and nearly 30% of the trap patients needed a reoperation. And of the reoperations, the most common reoperation in the trap group was tubes. So they ended up getting a tube after failing a second trap. And so um, the most common reason for failure was uh, failure uh, was an inadequate IOP reduction. And then hypotony was more common in the trap group than the tube group. Um, and again, that's the caveat again is that a lot of these patients had already failed the TRAB, so it does introduce bias in the study towards tubes. So that's something to think about when you're thinking about the TRAB versus tube study. And so I just wanted to talk to you about a sort of roller coaster course, uh, one of our patients that we did a trial on a couple of months ago. This is a 70-year-old patient uh, with a past medical history of primary open angle glaucoma in the right eye, moderate stage, mild stage in the left eye. She had had a very successful TRAB years ago in the right eye. Her pressure is seven on no drops in that right eye. She's very happy with that right eye. The left eye, she's coming in with a pressure of 38 on max topical therapy. And just to show you her fields, so the right eye is the one that had the TRAB a few years ago. And you know that's the eye with the more severe glaucoma. The left eye doesn't have significant glaucoma that's damage on Humphrey visual field. A little bit of thinning on the left eye um, uh, on OCT. And so we had, you know, uh, sort of altered her medications and things and tried to maximize her medical therapy even more to see if we could get this under control without surgical intervention in that left eye. But her pressure remained in the 30s despite varying regimens. And she did not want to start having visual field loss in that left eye. This is her better seeing eye. You know, we talked to her about surgical options. She had a great trab in the right eye, so she said, let's go ahead and do a trab in the left eye. Um, gets her off for her drops, and, and it's her sort of, uh, given her experience in the right eye, it's a reasonable option. So we went ahead and took her to the, to the operating room for a trabeculectomy in the left eye. We placed three sutures, two wing sutures and a central suture. And then, so then here we go. So post-op day one, her pressure was 18. She looks great. Um, and remember, she was nearly 40 in, before surgery. Post-op day three, it's 16. She's, she's very happy. Uh, this particular patient has a, um, she checks her pressures at home and texts us her pressures. And so um, she texts us on post-op day six, says that her pressures are in the 50s. Um, feels okay, but you know, pressures are in the 50s. And so we tell her to come on in and let's take a look. So she, she comes in and she has a flat blub on exam. It's nearly a week out. So we think it's pretty reasonable at this point to do a laser suture lysis. And what that basically means is the three sutures that I mentioned, so you're going to cut those sutures with a laser to allow for that trapdoor um, partial thickness scleral flap that you created to open up and allow flow. So we cut one of her wing sutures, and it was, it was completely flat. There was no response whatsoever when we cut the wing suture. So said, okay, let's just let's cut one more suture. So we cut the central suture, and you just see fluid just kind of coming out on, uh, subconjunctivally there. So that opened things up. She still has one suture there that we don't mess with at this point because she now has an elevated, uh, elevated flap there. And so post-op day seven, her pressure is one. So we have her on steroids. We're trying to sort of allow uh, her pressure to, to increase. And she's you know, checking her pressure at home. Pressure is zero. She comes in. She's got an exuberant blood. Um, and her pressure is zero. We're, we're concerned at this point. She's hypotenuse. It's two weeks out. And so we're worried that this is her better seeing eye, and we're worried about something like hypotony maculopathy. So we actually take her back to the OR at two weeks out, and we replace two 10 nylon sutures for her and close everything back up. So this should be happily ever after, and it's not. So, so post-op course number two, so post-op day one, pressure is 40. It's way too early to do an anterior laser suture lysis at this point. Uh, so we treat her with aqueous suppressants and diamox, and she comes down to 18. 
Um, she hates the Diamox, it makes her feel terrible, so we cut back on the Diamox a little bit. She's still on some Diamox and her pressure's 30 at post-op day four. And we sort of hold our breath and we cut a, a, a stitch and she comes back post-op day six, her pressure's 40. So we cut a second stitch and she comes back post-op day 10, this is deja vu all over again. Pressure's 40 and she's literally hanging by a thread, right? That central final suture. Last time we cut that, you know, we took her back to the operating room for hypotony. So we cut that stitch and then we do what any glaucoma specialist goes home and does. And we go and pray and hope that things go well because that's all we have. And she does really well. So thankfully, we don't have to take her back to the operating room again. Um, her pressure, two months out now, her pressure is eight off of all drops in that left eye. She's really happy despite that post-operative course. She's got a diffusely elevated bleb. It looks great. This could have ended up very differently, and we've all seen it end up very differently with TRAVS, but thankfully there are patients who have great outcomes despite, like I said, the post-operative course can be very, very challenging in these patients. And um, the hit ABC show, Grey's Anatomy, knows this. And so they said the following. I want to play this. Ugh, lab. Is there a trap lining above? I don't know what it is, I just hate how it sounds. Bleb. Is it stem word? It doesn't. It's a word. It's not a word. It's a sound effect. Bleb. Well, who? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what's on the horizon? We've got the in focus coming out at some point. I think every glaucoma specialist is pretty excited about this. This is an ab external uh, approach to sort of a less, a more minimally invasive bleb, and they've had great outcomes with this so far, and so that's sort of on the horizon, and that could potentially rid us of this, you know, the, the old school way of doing a blood, which, um, like I said, has a lot of complications, but can be very, very effective, and still very much has a place in glaucoma. And so um, we'll see how the InFocus does clinically once it's FDA approved here, um, but I think we're all very excited about offering something to our patients that can be just as effective uh, without all of the issues that come along with um, doing a trabeculectomy. Any questions? Question? Oh, good. Just a comment. So uh, I, I think that might be a reasonable patient to put a Zen in. I uh, know she needed a very reliable feed. Is a Caucasian, we know, no primary surgery. This is probably a pretty good success. And the uh, other exciting thing is on AGSNet, uh, there is a video by Wang Kim, and also apparently Brian Francis are now doing app external sets. I think that would be exciting to see how that does. Yeah, uh, we're excited to try that external approach. I talked to Dr. Chai about it yesterday, actually. Um, I think Dr. Dr. Zabriskie had mentioned that you know some of the, um, the you had mentioned that part of the, the success that comes with trabeculectomies is approaching things from an ab external uh, approach, and that part of the issue with Zens, even besides just the tenons uh, issues, is that it is an ab internal approach. It seems to be that that uh, so far with Zen, I think uh, there is something to be said as a for example, as compared to in focus, which is ab-external, and you look at the data, and, and the ab-external approach seems to be much preferred. So maybe with the ab-external with Zen, um, you know, will will we'll be helpful. But certainly the failure rate of Zen is pretty high. Yeah. And I agree on this patient. You know, you could look at doing other things, but I know her well, and and um, and you know her. I, I could just I, I could comment on her in the context. And I know we have another presentation, but I just and thanks, Howard. I think that's a great presentation. Um, I, I just want to make just four quick comments. First off, in patients that have um, that really need a low pressure, and we could talk a lot about who those patients are. There is, there does seem to be something about getting a pressure that averages a procedure where the pressure is average about 12. And you could look at literature, you can look at the advanced uh, glaucoma intervention study, et cetera, et cetera. There does seem to be something about getting the pressure to 12 or less in people who need it. And in my opinion, there's only one way to get there, and that's a trabeculectomy, to get there reliably. Um, the, on MIGS, there is, you know, episclerovenous pressure is the floor, right? But the interesting thing about MIGS, and they, we estimate that the episclerovenous pressure is between 8 and 11, but the thing about MIGS is that the floor is higher than that. There's some other factor. 
And you look at all the MIGS data, you look at all the MIGS studies, and the, the pressure floor is in the mid-teens somewhere. So it's actually above episclerobenous pressure for some reason. And, and you know, we're just learning about that now, this kind of downstream resistance. So that's an important thing to think about in MIGS. Although I do MIGS all the time, if you're really aiming low, I think there's only one way to get it. And then finally, the TVT study that you quoted, there's so much press given to that study. I did a great summary. I, I, I have a lot of issues with the TV, that TVT study, and it really surprises me how much press it got. Um, it basically concludes that tubes are better as second procedures. And, you know, duh, we know that. That's why tubes exist. And, but, but this got you know, kind of out there in the literature and people started doing tubes instead of traps and there is nothing in that study that gives, I think, justification for doing that. Plus the complication rate on the trap side was just way too high. So it's, I think it's, there's a lot of problems with that. And then on the primary TVT study, which the one year data has been published last year, traps clearly had a lower pressure. And why no one really talks about that study, I don't know. But that, you know, it was presented at AGS last year. There's clearly a pressure advantage when you're talking about primary procedures with TRAB versus TUBE. So, you know, it, it's still, TRAB is still the low, pro, low pressure winner versus TUBEs when you're talking about primary surgeries. And then finally, just a comment, I, I you know, I always heard me say this, it was all my fellows. Um, sometimes your, your, your patient, what they need is for you to step up to the plate and hit them a home run. And a home run is a well-functioning trabeculectomy. That's what they need. They need pressures of 8, 9, 10, less than 12. There is something real about that in these progressors that are, that are beaten yet with their progressive disease. And they need, to hit you, they need you to hit them a home run. Well, sometimes when you're swinging for the fences, you're going to strike out too. And that's the thing about trabeculectomy. Sometimes you do. But I have always found that your patients in this setting, their, their vision's going down or their pressure's 40 and you cannot control it. You know, they tend to really understand the situation, and they'll, they'll you know, be your advocate with you as you try your best to get their pressure down to where it needs to be. And um, so that's kind of the game of, of traps, but when they need it, they need it. And, and it's just kind of the way it is. So uh, thanks, that was a great presentation. I just have one yeah. comment, too, along with what you were talking about. When you look at, when you look at surgical studies, one thing that was happened was that everybody took the data from the first tra trap versus two and assumed that meant they could they, they could do trap with two first first line. And the data didn't support that at all. Second thing is is <clears throat> there was not surgical it wasn't controlled surgical uh, there were too many surgeons who did too few cases at all all the data was lumped in one. So when you look when you study a, a surgical Paper, you need to know who's doing the surgery, and you need to know. And you can't take that data and start doing tubes as the first primary thing, and that's what people are doing. So if you're in the East Coast, you get tube first. If you're in South Florida, you get a, you get a laser. And the rest of us, whatever the hell we can do. So that's, that came out of that study, and that's it's a very interesting outcome. Not really understanding. Thanks everyone, thanks Arma.